Them touchdown pass. Peyton bounces around, throws. The ball will be caught. Julius Thomas, touchdown, Denver. What is up, guys? And thanks for joining me once again for another segment of Beyond the Sport. In this episode, I am going to be breaking down the NFL draft. This is going to be a part of a little bit of like a series, I guess you could say, because I'm going to do a ton of videos in relation to this. I'm going to break down a variety of things based on what we saw on Thursday through Saturday as it was a very successful draft. It was the highest viewed draft in NFL history. It crushed records dating back to the 2014 draft. There was a lot of good that came out of this, a lot of proceeds, a lot of donations that went towards COVID-19 relief. And uh, there were a lot of question marks going into this virtual draft and as to whether or not it was going to go very well. And it was a slam dunk. It was a grand slam. Any other sports terminology you can come up with uh, to really encapsulate just how well this draft went, you name it, uh, throw it out there because it was wildly successful. I thought that it went very smooth. The process was very clean. There were no hiccups. There was no sort of technological difficulties. They got in the way of teams making their selections. And it just felt really good overall. And I think that that's the highest compliment that you can give it. It felt normal. It didn't feel like it was something completely different. The product was the same. And bravo to the NFL as an entire league. Everyone involved. Roger Goodell. And everyone that goes below him. Because they all did a fantastic job of making this a truly memorable draft for all the right reasons. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down my biggest draft winners in this 2020 NFL Draft. One more disclaimer before I get this video going is, although this is a top five for both the biggest winners and the biggest losers, these are not supposed to be looked at as lists and as far as they go rankings because this isn't a one through five where number one was the best in uh, the winners category and number one was the worst in the losers category. It's simply just a top five. It's accumulation of teams that I believe belong in category A as the winners and category B as the losers. It's as simple as that. Starting off with the winners, my top five has to be the Cleveland Browns, the Dallas Cowboys, the Denver Broncos, the Minnesota Vikings, and the Arizona Cardinals. These teams drafted exceptionally well from top to bottom. They got great value to address their greatest needs and they filled in all the gaps that they had to going into the draft. And I will start off by saying there were a ton of other honorable mentions. I know the 49ers are a team that come to mind. Uh, I know that there were plenty of teams throughout the league that really put together some solid drafts and vastly improved their teams. And I think that it was very difficult to decide which teams were worthy of being in this top five. I know there's a lot of toss-ups. You could take one out and replace it with another. And I'm sure you could convince me that uh, one team deserves it over one of the teams that I listed. Um, but I just think it was very balanced draft, and a lot of teams came out of this winners for sure. First team on my winners list, the Dallas Cowboys. Starting off in round one with pick number 17, they chose to go CeeDee Lamb, wide receiver out of Oklahoma. There were a lot of needs that they could have addressed before this pick, but when you have a talent like CeeDee Lamb fall to your lap at 17, a guy that is very special talent and is in one of the best wide receiver draft classes we've seen based on pure potential. This was a no-brainer to take at 17. Then you go over to round two at pick number 51 and you swoop in on Trevon Diggs, cornerback out of Alabama. This was a very wise pick as this is a guy with great value and he's a position of need. They lost Byron Jones to free agency. That was a huge loss that secondary, one of which had vastly improved from previous years and there's no better way to fill it than with a guy in digs that I had as a first round talent. Then in round three at pick number 82, you go Neville Gallimore. It never hurts to improve the interior defensive line with a defensive tackle out of Oklahoma. He was a guy that showed flashes throughout the season and was a part of a much improved defense for Oklahoma. Uh, something which they had struggled with as a school as they won games with their offense. But he was a big piece of that defense. And talk about a great way to bolster your defensive line. Then in round four, at pick number 123, Reggie Robinson, the second out of Tulsa. This is a great cornerback pick to improve that secondary further with Trevon Diggs. You might as well continue to double dip a little bit as you're getting yourself another great piece to that secondary. And over to round five with pick number 146, 
They took Tyler Biadotze, center out of Wisconsin. This was one of my favorite picks for any teams in this year's draft. That was a great value pick. You're talking about a center who was extremely productive and was a huge part of that run game and the success that we've seen at Wisconsin over the years with Jonathan Taylor. This was a guy that's going to replace the now-retired Travis Frederick. And this is a team in the Cowboys that always values great offensive linemen, and they simply could not go wrong with a pick like this. Sticking on with round five, uh, pick 179, they took Bradley Ane, who's a defensive end out of Utah. This was a guy that was projected to go anywhere between the second and third round. So when you compare that to getting him at pick 179 in the fifth, that is extremely good value. That's a gold mine of a pick right there. That is a guy that can directly impact that defensive line alongside Gallimore. And talk about continuing to pick up the right pieces for the best of value. And then in round seven at pick 231, there is quarterback out of James Masson, Ben DiNucci. This is a solid pick when you consider the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty in the air as to whether or not Dak Prescott is going to sign a long-term extension. He's asking for a large sum of money, uh, and we don't know if Jerry Jones is going to want to give him that money, so you might as well take a guy late in the draft and see if he could potentially fill those shoes uh, if the situation arises. Second team on my winner's list, the Denver Broncos. Starting off in round one at pick number 15, the team decided to go with Jerry Judy, wide receiver out of Alabama. This was one of the best picks alongside that C.D. Lamb pick. That's a receiver with great value that was able to drop right into Denver's lap, and they took him at 15. There was a lot of rumors that they're going to have to trade up to get him. He was considered the number one receiver in this draft, yet they're able to get him at 15. Then over to round two at pick number 46, the rich get richer as they're going to take another wide receiver and KJ Hamler out of Penn State. This is a speedster that you could pair up with the great route running and all round play of Jerry Judy to improve that receiving core for Drew Locke. Then in round three at pick number 77, they decide to address that secondary with Michael Ojemudier out of Iowa. This was a very good corner, played great zone, is a hard hitting corner at that. A guy that Vic Fangio definitely had his uh, mindset on drafting as far as a guy that fits into his system. Keeping in round three at pick number 83, one of the best picks, not only in the entire draft, but at least for Denver's sake, in their draft and on their board, that is center Lloyd Cushenberry out of LSU. This was a great character piece. This is a guy that a lot of teams are very high on. He was projected to go in the second round. Uh, he was a toss-up between him and Cesar Ruiz as far as who was not only the best center prospect, but the best interior offensive lineman. And they definitely needed to fill that gap. That was a position of need. That is a home run pick right there. Then for the third and final round three pick at 95, they decided to get defensive lineman McTelvin Aguim out of Arkansas. This was a game wrecker for the Razorbacks as he was a guy that was able to tear it up. This is a position that Denver doesn't currently need, but I think it's like a Draymond Jones situation where you want to continue to bring in depth. You see teams like the Niners with their young studs a lot of depth on that d-line i think that they're trying to replicate that formula then in round four at pick 118 they took another weapon in titan albert o as they call him as it's a very difficult name to pronounce out of missouri this was drew Locke's former teammate he has chemistry with him the two connected for many touchdowns back in college and this is a speedster this is a guy that fits in and they continue to look for weapons then in round five at pick 178 the team decided to address their linebacker needs with Justin Strenaud out of Wake Forest. This was a guy who was high on their radar, and he fills a need that is pretty sizable as they are looking to bolster the depth in their linebacking core. Then in round six, at pick number 181, the team goes with guard Natane Mutai out of Fresno State. This is a guy that was a risky pick because he's very injury prone, but the value is all there as far as what he is able to bring to the table when he is healthy, in fact, as he was ranked one of the highest interior offensive lineman prospects, but uh, unfortunately for his sake, injuries bumped him all the way to the sixth round. Then in round seven at pick 252, they took yet another receiver with Tyree Cleveland out of Florida. This is another guy with great size and speed, and they continue to give Drew Locke some weapons as they're desperately in need of providing some offense as they're trying to compete with teams like the Chiefs. And the final pick of the draft for the Denver Broncos in round seven at pick 254, they took edge rusher Derek Tuska 
out of North Dakota State. This was a solid edge rusher. There's been a lot of good comparisons around the league. Uh, he was very productive back at North Dakota State. And this is a position that wasn't too big of a need for them. But this was the second last pick of the draft. And they figured they would bolster that D-line a little bit further and provide a little bit of depth because that never hurts. Third team on my list, the Cleveland Browns. Kicking off with round number one, the 10th overall pick. They decided to select offensive tackle Jedrick Wills out of Alabama. This was a great selection as they're a team that definitely needed to address the offensive tackle position. Wills was very high on just about every team's board as they swooped in on him. This pick made a lot of sense for them. Then in round two, at pick number 44, one of the best value picks, in my opinion, was safety Grant Delpit out of LSU. On my board, I had him going in the middle of the first round, yet he was able to drop to them into the second, and this was a great pick, as that is also another position in need, as the two things just combined very well. And then round three, pick number 88, they decided to go with defensive lineman Jordan Elliott out of Missouri. He is one of the most highly touted prospects as far as interior defensive lineman goes. He's a game wrecker, and this was a pick that uh, made sense for improving the depth on the D-line. They have some good edge rushers, so why not give them some help up the middle? Sticking along with round number three, at pick number 97, they went with linebacker Jacob Phillips out of LSU, one of the many talented defensive prospects for the Tigers. That's a guy that made a ton of sense for them improving their linebacking core this pick made a lot of sense and uh, got a high grade because of it. Then in round number four, at pick 115, they decided to go with tight end Harrison Bryant out of Florida Atlantic. Uh, this seems to be the common theme in the NFL as to taking those receiving threats because it's such a big passing game type of league. That's the direction the game's going towards. And they got him out of Florida Atlantic. This is a very good prospect who was a guy that may not have been the biggest of needs for them, but when a guy like that's available, you take him. Then in round number five, at pick number 160, they took center Nick Harris out of Washington. Uh, as they started off the draft with Jedrick Wills, uh, they went late in the fifth and got Nick Harris out of Washington as they wanted to continue to improve that offensive line to hold up the front for Baker Mayfield. Then to finish off what was a very good draft, in round six, at pick number 187, they took wide receiver Donovan Peoples-Jones out of Michigan. This is a prospect that absolutely killed in the combine. This was a great value pick. It wasn't a huge need when you have guys like Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr., the two LSU products. But at the end of the day, when you can be a part of a special wide receiver draft class and take him in the sixth round based on the pure potential that he does possess and the stuff that he was able to do at Michigan, I'd say this was a great pick to finish off your draft. Fourth team on my list, the Arizona Cardinals. Starting off in round number one with the eighth overall selection, they chose to go with the hybrid linebacker slash safety, Isaiah Simmons out of Clemson. And this was one of those bigger early on steals in the first round of the NFL draft. Isaiah Simmons is a highly touted prospect that was expected to go much earlier and he was able to fall right into their lap. And that's a position of need that they definitely were able to address. Should they have gone offensive tackle based on the fact that it was a bigger need? Maybe. But when you have a talent like Isaiah Simmons fall to you at eight, you don't hesitate to take him. Then all the way over into round number three at the 72nd overall pick, they went with offensive tackle Josh Jones out of Houston. This was an A-plus pick for me because I had Josh Jones going very high. He was my fifth overall offensive tackle in this draft class. And he slipped all the way to the third round. And that is a great position of need, like I mentioned. So being able to get a guy like that after then taking Simmons make you that much happier that you did what you did in the first round at pick number eight. Then in round four at pick number 114, they went with defensive tackle Lakai Fotu out of Utah. This was a pick that not necessarily was the biggest of needs but this was a value pick. He was a guy that I thought was going to go a little bit earlier. He's one of the top interior pass rushers that this draft class has to offer. And Utah always is able to put out great talents on that defensive line. So why not swoop on in and get one yourself? Then also in round number four at pick number 131, they went with defensive lineman Richard Lawrence out of LSU. 
This was a very stacked LSU defense that played very well all season and led to an undefeated season and a national championship game. So why not get yourself a part of that defense with defensive lineman Richard Lawrence? He was very productive in college. This was another one of those picks where it wasn't a huge need, but they were able to bring him in nonetheless. A little bit more questionable, especially after they went with Foto, but these are guys that are definitely going to help that defensive line of theirs. Then in round number six, at pick number 202, another incredible value pick in my opinion, and that is linebacker Evan Weaver out of Cal. He's not the most athletic guy on the field. He's not going to you know, show 4-4 four, four speed. He's not like the Isaiah Simmons that they picked earlier in the draft, but this is one of the best form tacklers, which I know a lot of coaches around the league can appreciate. Uh, he always seems to have a great first step and tracks down guys by taking a great angle of pursuit. This was a home run pick for me as that was a great player to take at 202. Then to finish it off in round number seven at pick 222, they took running back Eno Benjamin out of Arizona State. This is a guy in Eno that I thought was going to go much earlier. He's one of my top 10 halfbacks. I had him going in between the fourth and fifth round most realistically and he was able to slip all the way to them at seven. He's a hometown guy, played at Arizona State and he's going to be able to stay in the state of Arizona with the Cardinals who got a gem in Kenyon Drake and that Dolphins trade. So why not bring in Eno to solidify that backfield just a little bit more. And the fifth and final team on this list, the Minnesota Vikings. To start off, one of what was 15 draft picks in this year's draft class. In round one, pick number 22, they decided to go wide receiver Justin Jefferson out of LSU. This was a great pick, in my opinion, because another great wide receiver with very high value, great ceiling, as he produced back at LSU, and he dropped to them after the Eagles decided not to take him at 21. That was a head-scratcher to me, and I think it is so perfect for them because that is such a big team need with Stephon Diggs no longer being a part of the team after being traded. Then, also later on in round one at pick number 31, they go cornerback Jeff Gladney out of TCU. This is perfect to me because I had him going in late in the first round and this is also a huge need of theirs they got to replace Xavier Rhodes who was a guy that struggled heavily for them in his last season as a Viking and uh, these two combinations just mix very well in my opinion then in round number two at pick number 58 they get offensive tackle Ezra Cleveland out of Boise State this was one of my highest regarded offensive tackles in my rankings list I expected him to go rather high so the fact that they were able to get him at pick number 58 seemed just right and uh, that's a position in need as they're a team that's always looking to improve their offensive tackles. they got to keep Kirk Cousins upright. Then in round three, at pick number 89, they go cornerback Cameron Dantzler out of Mississippi State. Another great pick, in my opinion, to improve that secondary, something of which was good at the safety positions, but the cornerback positions not so much. So I think that this was a great pick based on the value that he provided them with, being that he slipped in the draft, in my opinion. Then in round number four, I picked number 117, defensive end DJ Wanham out of South Carolina. This pick was a little bit more interesting to me. I do think it's good that they're going to be able to replace uh, guys like Everson Griffin on that defensive line. They're going to have a lot of rotational pieces that they can move around, which is going to be crucial because losing Griffin definitely hurt them. Then in that same round at pick number 130, defensive tackle James Lynch out of Baylor. This was another guy that's going to go towards just that. Then in round number four, for the third pick of the round, at pick number 132, they get linebacker Troy Dye out of Oregon. Uh, this was one of their best picks in the draft based on need mixed with the fact that this was a guy that I projected to go much earlier. I thought he was going to be off the board well before when they got him at pick number 132. So I think that this mixes very well with their defense. Then in round number five, at pick 169, they get cornerback Harrison Hand out of Temple. They continue to take some defensive backs to improve that secondary. I don't think you can really go wrong there. It's always nice to have depth. Then in round number five, pick number 176, wide receiver K.J. Osborne out of Miami. Uh, with how stacked this draft class was, it's definitely good to get your hands on not just one, but multiple receivers in what was a very talented class. Then in round number six, I pick 203. They go offensive tackle. Blake Brandell out of Oregon State. It does not hurt to improve your offensive line, even if it means providing depth, because if a guy goes down, all of a sudden you have another guy that could step up. I like this pick. Then in round number six, I pick 205. They go safety, Joss 
uh, Metellus out of Michigan. This was a pick where I don't quite agree with it as much because they have a very good safety group in Harrison Smith and Anthony Harris, but uh, Harrison Smith isn't getting any younger, so I can kind of understand it from that perspective. You're trying to bring in a young guy that can compete in the future. Then in round number seven, I picked 225 defensive end Kenny Willicks out of Michigan State. This was a good pick for the value that he had. I thought he was going to go earlier. This seemed to be a common theme in this year's draft. Then in round number seven, pick number 244, Nate Stanley, quarterback out of Iowa. This was a pick where they're trying to bring in a backup to Kirk Cousins. And based on the value, I think that that's fine to take him late in this draft. It wasn't a big necessity, but they're able to take him late for what wasn't a too bad of a pick. Then in round number seven for the second pick of that round at 249, they took safety Brian Cole, the second out of Mississippi State. Uh, this was a better pick just on the fact that this was a good value pick. But again, uh, taking another safety didn't make as much sense to me. And to cap it all off, in round number seven at pick 253, they went with offensive lineman Kyle Hinton out of Washburn. And they continued to go the route of improving that O-line. And uh, all around, I thought that they had a very successful draft. Thanks again for watching, guys. Really do appreciate you guys taking the time out of your days to watch these videos. And uh, make sure to let me know in the comments, what do you think about this video? What would you change? Was there a different team that you had in mind? Uh, was there a couple of players that you think I was just completely wrong about based on team needs or the value of the pick itself? Make sure to let me know. I love having discussions amongst you guys, hearing your uh, feedback. As it's definitely fun to interact with the people who check out the videos. Uh, but thanks again. And uh, also make sure to follow on Instagram for more Beyond the Sport content at Beyond the Sport. I do a lot of bonus stuff on there, such as Instagram live sessions on Fridays every week at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I've been doing a little bit of a new series where I've been creating graphics for my top 10 uh, positional players among each position from the rookie class of this year's draft. So make sure to check that out as well. But uh, thanks again, guys, and have a good one.